Oh, Holy Spirit, help us to see what it was like to be in Joshua's shoes and see God in the what the are you thinking battle for Jericho. Amen. Oh, good day. Good news. We are finally getting around to looking at Joshua's first battle in the Promised Land. And it's safe to say that the Bible's portrayal of Joshua's battle against Jericho is vastly different to what happens in Veggie Tales, Josh and the Big Wall. And we will begin in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Last week, we left Joshua with his whole army totally incapacitated due to the circumcision God had requested them to undergo. So they would have a physical sign to remind them that they were God's people. Firstly, I hope you took some time this last week to ask the Holy Spirit to circumcise your heart and that the operation went well and now your heart is even more on fire for God than it was before. Secondly, I also wonder whether your imagination started speculating about how Joshua felt with his army out of action for a couple of weeks. When I read the narrative and realised the implications of obeying God's request, I wondered, ooh, did Joshua go, hey God, what are you thinking? Strategically speaking, this is a real bad move. This has made us very vulnerable. We are supposed to be preparing for battle. It is all well and good, God, for you to say that you have rolled away the reproach of Egypt. But, Fadinka, this could turn real nasty. The groans of pain from the men, well, they can be heard all the way to Jericho. And so all they have to do is send out just a few soldiers and they will wipe us out. Now remember, at this point in time, while Joshua had the spies report where Rahab had told them, we heard how the Lord dried up the Red Sea and how you destroyed the Amorites and everyone's courage failed. For the Lord, your God, is God in heaven and earth. But Joshua wasn't aware of the Bible's spoiler alert as it updates us with when all the kings heard how the Lord had dried up the Jordan, they had no courage left to face the Israelites. So I started thinking, well that's dangerous, I know, whether Joshua, as he watched the surrounding country folk, rush into the protection of Jericho and its massive wall, while they lay useless, unable to defend or attack, would have tried to bolster his confidence in that God does know what he is doing. Actually, I would love to know what tactics do you use when God's assigned task seems impossible to convince yourself that God does know what he is doing? It is likely that Joshua thought about how God was obviously big into signs as a way of guaranteeing his promises will happen. Perhaps Joshua went right back to the creation narrative and God's first sign of the seventh day of rest and wondered whether the circumcision might not also be a way of making them rest. Or did Joshua remember how he had witnessed God setting this Sabbath sign in stone? Would he have thought about how as a young man he had excitedly watched with awe and wonder as God created a water wall on each side of them as he 
walked across the dry Red Sea. And then there was the cloud and the fire always there above the tent of meeting as a physical sign of God's presence. Did he find all those memories of God's signs enough to encourage him as he prepared to lead the army into battle against Jericho? Or perhaps Joshua was like most of us, well, me at least, and Joshua wanted just one more assurance, just one more promise that his presence was with them, or just one more sign that would prove to him beyond a doubt that God was with him in this battle. Did he think, oh, wouldn't it be great to be like Moses and to get to talk to God face to face. That way I will definitely know exactly what you want me to do. How I should go about tackling Jericho. Like have you seen that wall surrounding the city? How am I supposed to bring that down? And at long last the army has recovered. They have celebrated the Passover and now the manna is gone. They are now eating food from the promised land. And finally, we now get to compare Veggie Tales, Josh and the Big Wall with the biblical narrative describing the fall of Jericho. Firstly, have you ever thought about why did Joshua go out of the camp during the night? According to Veggie Tales, it was so he would have space to think and pray free from distractions, which would make it easier to talk and hear God's response. Aha! Uh -huh. But now, strangely enough, we discover that Veggie Tales might not be quite accurate in this instance, because you see, the Bible doesn't say Joshua went out of the camp alone at night. The narrative, well it literally says Joshua was near Jericho. <laughs> Typical, just a brief statement and because we are reading it a very long time afterwards, we don't know what time of day or night Joshua happened to be near Jericho. And while modern Western scholars may debate about who wrote Joshua, the Jewish people firmly believe it was written by Joshua himself. Well, aside from some of the obvious bits that weren't, like his funeral. This means the original audience would have known what happened here. Though we do find that Veggie Tales gives a fairly accurate portrayal of this narrative. Joshua saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua asked, are you for us or for our enemies? And he replied, neither, but as commander of the Lord's army, I have now come. And I reckon VeggieTales did a pretty good job in making Archibald Asparagus a very imposing commander. He certainly would not be somebody you would want to mess with. Just like the real commander Joshua saw. And while I'm not sure that the real Joshua did a full on face plan like in VeggieTales, the narrative it does tell us Joshua, in reverence, fell face down to the ground, asking, what message does my Lord have for his servant? And for obvious reasons, this next part, well, it just could not be included in Veggie Tales. And the commander replied, take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua 
did so. Hopefully, you know what event this would have reminded Joshua of. Yep, Joshua would have remembered Moses telling the story of how he met God in the burning bush and God had told him to take his sandals off because he was standing on holy ground. Previously, when you have read or heard this narrative, have you ever stopped to think about how you would feel meeting the commander of the Lord's army in the flesh? The Bible, it just doesn't tell us how Joshua felt. But maybe he had this flashback to when he was on the mountain with Moses and had heard God say, See, I am sending an angel overhead of you to guard you and to bring you to the place I have prepared. Listen to what he says. Yes, my angel is going ahead of you. Did Joshua go, well, what the? This is God's commander speaking to me? Oh, I can be confident. He is going ahead of me. Now, going by Joshua's past experiences with God's out there directions, I wonder, did Joshua half expect God's commander to give instructions that would make him think, what the, as he listened to him say, see, I have delivered Jericho into your hands. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. At this point, Joshua probably would have been thinking, okay, now that's really weird. I don't get it. I was thinking a long protracted siege would be the go, considering the wall. But I have seen enough of God's strange directions in action to know he will come through. And then the commander goes, have seven priests carrying a trumpet. Oh, by the way, the English translation trumpet is actually a shofar, a long curved ram's horn, which we will call it from now on, in front of the ark. And on the seventh day, march around the city seven times. Actually, this would have been a major, what the, are you thinking God, for Joshua? I know I hadn't, but have you ever stopped to think what that means? One of those days had to be the Sabbath. This would have blown Joshua away. He knew just how serious God was about the Sabbath. Not only had it been declared from the very beginning, it was now inscribed in stone. And for the past 40 years, the manner God provided for them only came for six days. There was never, ever any manner on the seventh day. So they could rest. He had heard God command, you must observe my Sabbath. This will be a sign between me and you for all generations to come. So you may know that I am the Lord who makes you holy. It is to be holy to you. Anyone who desecrates it must be put to death. So Joshua would have been like, what the is the commander thinking? God is deadly serious about keeping the Sabbath. And now he is informing me that the army is to take the city on the seventh day. And while in the moment Joshua probably couldn't see God's reasoning, but scholars who in hindsight are able to see this was God's way of emphasizing his complete control 
over the outcome. This was no ordinary everyday work. This was a covenant deal commanded by God. And it was to be God alone who was to get all the glory and all the praise for the victorious outcome. There would never ever be any doubt in either Israel or the inhabitants of Jericho's minds that the victory was all God's doing. And then the command continues with, have the priest blowing the shofar. And when you hear a long shofar blast, have all the people give a loud shout and the wall of the city will collapse and the people will go up every man straight in. I reckon Joshua would have thought, oh, what the? Pull the other one. It plays jingle bells. Like seriously, have you seen those walls? Look at them. They go right up to the sky. And you're telling me they will just collapse when the shofar shout sounds and the army shouts. Now, what we need to realize is that Joshua is looking at a wall that is 10 stories high. Jericho's city wall was ingeniously designed, which we will explore next time. So VeggieTales got the idea of an imposing wall right, but it wasn't made of metal, but of mud brick. But despite the evidence of an impenetrable fortress before his eyes, Joshua has seen enough of what God can do. And also, what happens when you don't believe God can or will do what he says he is going to do. He knows better than those ten spies did. Joshua's like, yep, I'm not going to make their mistake. So if God says this is how it's going to happen, it will. And amongst all that self-talk, I wonder whether Joshua, as he heard the commander start talking about the seven long shofar blasts, did he have another memory flashback, vividly remembering the incredible time as Moses went to meet with God. And there was this sensational sound show happening with all the thunder and lightning and this very loud shofar blast making everyone in the camp tremble. And the sound of the shofar grew louder and louder. There is just no way Joshua would ever forget the incredible sound as the shofars became louder and louder until they reached a deafening crescendo. I had not realized how deafening the sound would have been. Sad to say, but until now, I had actually visualized a modern trumpet. So the loudest trumpet I had heard was from my father's brass band CD. Definitely not something to bring walls tumbling down. But just before I started writing this message, God arranged it for my son Ashley and I to head to the top of Harding's paddock. And as we walked, we were surrounded by the deafening sound of the cicada insects giving out this incredibly loud warning signal which reverberated around us and actually felt like it was vibrating inside us, shaking us to our very core. Believe me, it was terrifying and very painful. After just a couple of minutes, it was so bad we both felt like running away to escape the awful, horrible sound. And I reckon the shofar would be far louder and way more deafening, creating even stronger vibrations than what we experienced from the cicadas. Therefore, to Joshua, this statement, while weird, at 
the same time also made sense. He knew after hearing it many times to let the camp know it was time to pack up and move on. So he knew seven of them would be intimidating to the people stuck in Jericho who would have nowhere to escape the noise bouncing off their high walls. The Bible doesn't tell us whether Joshua had any doubts about what he was told to do. So as the Bible usually does give us a glimpse into people's negative thinking, we can fairly safely assume Joshua, while possibly perplexed, did not have any real doubts about God's ability to bring down the walls like he said. And yet what is really fascinating is how we don't hear any of the usual whining and complaining from the Israelites like happened in the desert with Moses or as we see them do in Veggie Tales. This really does make it look possible that Joshua and the army was headed to Jericho, possibly with the idea to set up siege fortifications. And so the whole army saw Joshua talking with the imposing commander of the Lord's army. And apparently they didn't want to argue the point with him like they happily did with Moses. Not only that, but in the Bible reading, we immediately have Joshua telling everyone to advance much around the city, with the armed guard going ahead of the Ark of the Lord. The seven priests moved forward, blowing their shofars. The Ark followed them, and the rear guard following behind them. Oh, wait a minute. Have you noticed all the sevens in the commander's directive? Seven priests with seven shofars, seven days, then seven times around the city on the seventh day. As you may be aware, biblically, seven is the perfect number. And therefore, we can conclude that God's commander is saying this will be a perfectly perfect campaign. And then Joshua commanded, do not give a war cry. Do not raise your voices. Do not say a word until the day I tell you to shout. Then shout. The ark of the Lord circled around the city once. Then they returned to camp. Another question. Have you thought about how long it would have taken for the army to march around the city? Oh, just a hint. There was quite a few more guys than what was shown in Veggie Tales. And while the actual army was over 600,000 men, it was only about 40,000 men who had crossed over the Jordan ready for war. Thankfully, a guy called Andre Alex has done the calculations and bases it on the assumption that the archaeologists are correct about Jericho's size and that the priests carrying the ark and those priests blowing their shofars would be walking slower than normal. And so he calculated that it would take about an hour for the Israelites to walk around Jericho. Can you imagine what it would have been like for the people stuck inside Jericho? with the sound of the shofar ringing in their ears for a whole hour. I mean, not that it's the same sound as what I'm going to say, but when our smoke detector goes off, don't we quickly try to kill the awful ear-splitting sound? The people of Jericho would have been like, what the, what is he thinking? Is he trying to drive us out with that? horrible sound, then after an hour, and thankfully, the sound has stopped and the Israelites have marched back to camp again. And they would have been like, 
Now, what is he thinking? We were almost ready to give in. Another hour, maybe less, and the white flag would have gone up for sure. For six days, they endured the hour of painfully loud, vibrating noise. And the, what the, complete silence from the army. There wasn't even a whisper to be heard from the soldiers. And now it's the seventh day. And they go, what the, it's daybreak and the army's already marching around the city? Except they kept going and going and going for seven times. The people in Jericho would have been like, what the, why didn't they do that on the first day? By now we have kind of got used to the noise. All right, now it's starting to get unbearable. We might have to cave soon. Wait, what, what the, is he thinking? For the noise had stopped. And so had the army. What gives here? The priest gave a long blast on the shofar. Joshua commanded, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. And the people shouted with all their might. And the wall collapsed, and every man charged straight up and in. This would have been a major what the is happening here moment for both opposing sides. For you see, the chances are that, just like in VeggieTales, there was this brief moment of pause before the wall started coming down. And for that moment, the Israeli army would have been feeling kind of sheepish and foolish, thinking, what the are we supposed to do now? as nothing happened. And inside Jericho, they would have been thinking, what the are they thinking now? This is totally crazy. Why do they think just shouting will scare us when the awful sound of the shofar hasn't worked? Sure, the two combined is definitely not nice. But we are not giving up our city to you guys just because you shout at us. And then, after the dramatic pause, they watched the wall come tumbling down. They would have had this major, what the, how the hell did that happen, feeling. And for both sides, the only possible explanation was that Israel's God was acting on behalf of Israel to give them victory over anyone who tried to prevent them from entering the promised land. It was clearly obvious to all and sundry that the Lord was with Joshua and his fame spread throughout the land. So we're going to pray. And Lord, we pray that just as you were with Joshua, you will be with us and our fame will be that we are genuine Christians who follow you despite wondering, what the are you thinking, Lord? And this knowledge will spread to all those who know us and even to those who don't. Amen.